most gracious and heavenly Father. We do thank you that you set a star ahead to lead, to lead those to Christ, your Son. We thank you that you set that star ahead of us, that we may come into that deep relationship with you through the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, let our eyes always be open to see your hand at work, our ears to hear your word, our hearts to receive and embrace it. And Holy Spirit, continue to lead us, that we may have that deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior. Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to see you in the house of the Lord today where we do truly do worship our Lord and Savior, the risen King Jesus. And as always, guess what? He's glad you're here today. He's glad you're here to worship him. And we are so glad that you're here today because we're in fellowship where we can worship a risen Lord. Today is the Feast of the Epiphany. How many of y'all ever had an epiphany? You know, epiphany, by definition, is something that is revealed that you didn't know before or it's something that you gain a new insight into. Okay, there's... How many of you ever looked at something some way and somebody explained it and go, Oh, wow, I didn't think of it that way. I want to call the Feast of the Epiphany Sunday the V8 Sunday. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I could have had a V8. You know what I'm talking about. It's a revelation to you. It's a revelation of something that you didn't know and may have come to know. It's something that somebody has shared with you and all of a sudden it brings on a new meaning and a new light and a new way of looking at it. Something that you hadn't thought of before. That's an epiphany. And today is the Feast of the Epiphany. If you've been with us throughout the Christmas season or somewhere else, anywhere you go in town, you're going to find a creche, right? That that they allow you to put a creche. You know, that's the one with Jesus in the manger and Mary and Joseph and the three wise men. Guess what? That's like, they shouldn't have been there. If you were here, you would have watched them come from one of the windowsills all the way. They're here. They've arrived. They're here. We often tell the story that they were there when Jesus was born, but the reality is they probably weren't. The reality is they were traveling to see who Jesus was. It's been documented that in 7 BC, after 853 years, Saturn and Jupiter came into the same constellation of Pisces. Now, it's really interesting because when you think about it, the Jews had been captured by the Assyrians. They'd been captured by the Babylonians. They'd been taken into exile. They'd been scattered. And many of them decided to stay where they were after they'd brought the Jews back to Jerusalem. Many of them had already established businesses. They established families there. They had established everything. And so they decided to stay. That's what we call the diaspora. And they decided to stay where they were. But they also knew of the prophecies. They would have known of the prophecies that foretold of a Messiah who comes. In Numbers, in the 24th chapter, in the 17th verse, all the way back into Numbers, when Moses was in the desert, they had this prophecy. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. These are the promises that have been foretold to them. In Christmas time, we read out of Micah. We read out of his prophecy, O Bethlehem of Epaphra, the smallest shall come a king. The smallest shall come the Messiah. All of these prophecies that have been ful- are being fulfilled in this manner. It tells about a star that would arise. And so what we find is that these astronomers and these astrologers, and there were definitely Jewish astrologers as well and astronomers, and we bring two planets that had never been before into alignment in the constellation. Jupiter was called the king's planet. Saturn was the defender. And Judah was recognized as the as Pisces, 
So bringing these in in 7 BC, they would have recognized it. And then again, it came back in later into the same thing. A sign of something great that was happening. A sign of, that they would have, the Magi would have known the Jewish prophecies because they'd stayed there in that diaspora, in that area. They would have seen it that something great was being announced. And then in 5 BC, a great nova had occurred. A planet bursting in this big star traversing rapidly across the sky leading to Judea. And they knew something happened. Now when you think about it, that's God's plan, isn't it? All of a sudden, from all the way back in Genesis, when he says that I'm going to bring you a Savior, all the way up until now, this is God's perfect plan. Because why? Because God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. They're His. Psalm 89 reminds us of that. Psalm 89 reminds us that the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. All of this. It's God's revelation to us. It's God's revealing himself to the world. But we have to understand that revelation and we have to think and say, is it really? Or do we ignore it? Do we ignore that revelation? Do we ignore what God is doing in our lives or around our lives? Do we ignore it? Our gospel today really has three different groups of people in it, if we really look at it. And I think it's really interesting if we really dissect it just a little bit. The first person that we really recognize in our gospel is King Herod. Okay? Now, I don't know how much you know about King Herod. But King Herod was an amazing king. From a standpoint that he built, rebuilt the temple to its glory. He, he built Masada. He built a number of different places. He was favored by Rome, but he built all these great places and great tributes. But the one thing about Herod is he wanted it only for himself. He wanted all the glory for himself. Herod had come out of the tribe of Esau. Now, Esau might not mean anything to you, but you might have heard of Jacob and Esau. Remember how Esau dressed up, or Jacob had dressed up in that coat and smelled nasty and went to his father, Jacob, for the blessing? Yeah. And he got it. And Esau was only after a bowl of food. See, Esau was more about the world than about serving God. Jacob wanted to serve God. (laughs) This is like Herod. Herod knew of God. He came out of the line of Esau. But Herod was a megalomaniac, really. He was more concerned about himself. How many of y'all know that Herod killed one of his sons and killed one of his wives? He killed them because he was jealous. He was afraid. He was paranoid that they would take power. He wanted all the power for himself. He wanted everything for himself. He wanted the glory. Not to give the glory to God, but to take the glory himself. How many of y'all know people like that? Come on. This means yes. There is no no, because I know everybody knows somebody like that. But it's true. This is what Herod was. And he was so paranoid. I even think his staff didn't tell him what was happening because either they were oblivious to it or because they were afraid. So Herod gets blindsided in this whole process. So here's this Nova that's coming across. And here comes the wise men following. Now we don't know how many wise men there were. Because all we know is that they brought how many gifts? Three gifts, right? They brought frankincense, myrrh, and gold. And frankincense and myrrh were as valuable or more valuable even than the gold that they brought. But they brought three gifts. So we associate it with three wise men or three kings. We three kings of war. No, no, I'm not going to go any further. Three gifts. Myrrh was an anointing oil. Anybody who became a king or became a leader was anointed 
they bring a very valuable and precious gift as anointing to Jesus for who he is. Frankincense was a perfume and God loves the smell of those incense rising to him and the fragrances, the sweet fragrances of the offering and gold was there to help them. St. Bede actually named them. We have no idea if they really were they named. But St. Bede actually named the three wise men as Melchor, Gaspar, and Balthazar. We don't know their names, but what we do know is that they traveled. They weren't afraid to travel with this great wealth. And probably they had a great entourage because the city of Jerusalem became stirred, as it says, on their arrival. Now, think about it this way. You go to your favorite shopping mall, right? Maybe yours is Walmart, and I'll just use that as an example. How many cars come in and out while you're there? Okay, doesn't make a difference. You don't notice them. You just kind of, they're there, right? Well, if these three kings or these three magi or whoever they were came strolling into Jerusalem on a camel, they probably weren't going to be raising a big stir. But when people traveled that way and they had that much wealth, they probably had a big caravan with them. So if you're in the parking lot and all of a sudden the fire engines come in and the police car come in, what happens? Your interest gets spurred, doesn't it? You wonder what's happening. It would create that curiosity. And it must have stirred enough because they went to Herod and they asked Herod, where is the child? Where's the king of the Jews? Where's he born? Herod's paranoia kicks up. And so he asks his chief priests and his scribes, and then they tell him, oh yeah, this was foretold, king. <laughs> you know, we forgot to mention it to you, but this is what was foretold. Imagine, it's been going on for how long? And in Matthew's gospel, it says they met the child, which means that he was probably two years old because that's why Herod went and had them go kill all the children that were two years of, all the males that were two years or younger. Herod was all about the world. Herod was all about himself. And we know people like that. God reveals himself in a spectacular way, but they don't want to hear about who he is. They're all about what I can get, what I can gain. It's true today as it was then. And then we have the chief priests and the scribes they knew about the prophecies. But they were more involved in the ritual and how they looked. It's like going to a church and all they care about is how well do we do this. Well, we want to do everything good for God. We want to do it with excellence. But it's more about, oh, look at our beauty of this. Look at our beauty of that. Jesus reminded his disciples when they were over on the Mount of Olive when they said, oh, look at the beauty of the temple. And Jesus said, it's going to fall. But here's the point. Is that we can become religious. We can come and just sit in our pews. We can come and just say, okay, I know God. But do they have a relationship and are they seeking Him? And then you have the Magi. They're not Christian or they're not Jewish, but yet they come because they're curious. They come because they know something spectacular has happened. They come because they want to learn. And they're greeted. And they listen to the angel in the end and go off in a different way. And again, God's prophecy is fulfilled. Because Mary and Joseph and the child, Jesus, go to Egypt. And the prophecy was out of Egypt shall come a Messiah. You see, God's orchestrated plan comes into being. But if we're not looking for it, we can't have that V8 moment like, wow, I didn't realize that. That's the beauty of God, that He always foretells what's happening. He will always show you ahead of time, not that you need to act on it immediately, but He tells you what's going to happen, and when the time is right to act upon it. 
a reading in Ephesians is a great explanation and a great example of God's revelation because it's being written by Paul Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees Paul understood and knew scriptures inside and out but he was so focused that he missed about the revelation of when the Messiah would come he was more about the words rather than the action and he wanted to defend it he was so zealous to try and meet everything of the law and he was actually traveling to Damascus 127 miles away to bring Jewish people back to put them in the prison because they believed and followed in Jesus and along the way he's struck down a bright light shines he's tossed to the ground Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? I'm Jesus. A revelation. A revelation that he had and the zeal that he had to persecute the church now became the zeal to spread the good news of the church. A revelation. He says, it was a revelation made known to me by a revelation. The promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. And he shares what God has done. The Magi probably went back and shared exactly what had happened to them. They had seen the Messiah, whether they fully followed him or not, but they understood that Jewish prophecy had been fulfilled. But today, we too can see that star. We too can be a star for somebody else when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ and the revelation that he gives us about his grace and his mercy. We too can be that hope. Yesterday, I went to the Diocesan pre-convention. I'd be glad to share it with you if you promise not to fall asleep. I know I'm being recorded, so I'm in trouble already. (laughs) And it was good because I got to see people I knew and that. But a day prior, actually a day and a half prior, somebody messaged me on Facebook. And it's somebody that I know in the community and her mother had died on New Year's Eve and they were having a reception and her sister who is on vestry at the cathedral in Nashville an Episcopalian she says I know my sister would really like this I would really like this my dad's not religious but could you come and say something It wasn't about doing a memorial service, which I could have said, okay, now we're going to do it out of, you know, the prayer book. But it was about being there in the ministry of presence. And so her sister Anna got up and thanked everybody who had came. And she says, Father Dave has come to say a prayer. And that's all it was. You see, I was able to share with the husband who had just lost a wife. I was able to share with two daughters that had just lost a mother. I was able to just share with the people who were there about the gift that God has given us in that person. But if I didn't know Jesus, and I didn't have that confidence in who He is, How could I even share the hope of the resurrection? How could I even share about His grace and His mercy? You see, that's the beauty of knowing Jesus. That's the beauty of following the star. That we can be a ministry of presence. Like in our closing prayer. We can help those who are afflicted. We can support those who are weak. We can do those kind of things by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. 
But we have to let that revelation of God come into our lives. And He will reveal things in you that He would like to see you do. He will reveal things in you that He would like to see you correct. He'll reveal. But He's a God of grace. He'll do that. We can be like Herod and be more concerned about the things of the world. And about how we look to the world and how we're presented and how we don't want our little platform being taken down. That it looks to our glory. We can be like the chief priests and the scribes who knew the law and just come and go through the roteness of church and say, oh, I've been there. I'm a Christian. I've been there. Or we can be like the Magi in the respects of saying, Lord, I want to follow your star. I want to see where you're going to take me. I want to see where you're going to lead me. I want to see your grace and your mercy. I want to be a part of that in the world today so that others can have hope, so that others can be comforted, so others can be helped. So others can experience the joy. And when I get into those situations, people can minister to me because of who you are. The Magi came. They're here. And now they've left. The crash will come down tomorrow. The crash scene here will go away. But Jesus and the star that led him will never go away. He will always be with us to share with the world his grace, his love, and his mercy and give it hope. Amen. Through Christ our Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The star shone, the Magi came. But which star will you follow? Will you follow the star of the world as Herod did? Will you follow the star of just going through the motions as the chief priests and the scribes did? Or will you follow the star that aroused the Magi to travel all that distance? Will you follow the star of Jesus and let him lead you to the place where he wants you to be? And allow him to reveal in your life what he wants you to do. Allows you to come before him. Will you follow his star? Because when we follow his star and we come to have that relationship with him, we can go forth into the world in peace. We will have the good courage to go forth. We will hold fast that which is good and we won't render anyone evil for evil. We will strengthen those who are faint-hearted and those who are weak will be able to help and support. And those who are afflicted, we will be able to help. And one thing we will be able to do is honor all persons because we want to love and serve the Lord and because we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. When we follow His star, when we serve that risen King, we will be able to sing to the King. So let us stand. Our going forth song is sing to the King who is coming again.